This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio. This week, we've got John Lapoter, IAQA's outgoing president. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the state of the industry. Please visit our YouTube page. Leave a comment, subscribe to IAQ Radio. You can also keep up with us on Facebook, and uh, we've moved the uh, podcasts over to Podbean. Uh, you can find the link on our website. They're still up on TalkShoe, too, but TalkShoe's had some technical issues lately. We had to move over to Podbean. Last but not least, please visit the IAQ Training Institute website for the most current dates for the training you trust at iaqtraining.com. All right, let's go thank our marquee sponsors. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at healthyindoors.com. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. Particlesplus.com. Count on us. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report that there were no correct answers to last week's IQ Radio trivia question, which was, why were the kangaroo and emu chosen to hold the shield in Australia's coat of arms? The answer is, neither of those animals is able to walk backwards. The IQ Radio trivia question for today, Friday, March 30, 2018, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning and decontamination problems. Here is today's trivia question. Astronomer, mathematician, philosopher, and physicist Galileo Galilei died on January 8th, 1642. Name the cosmologist and physicist who was born on the same day 300 years later. Back to you, Joe. Wow. Good one, Cliff. All right. John and his wife, Lydia, John Lapoter and Lydia Lapoter own and operate Orlando, Florida-based indoor air quality solutions since 2001. John's a building envelope and indoor environmental consultant specializing in building product failure investigation, forensic water intrusion investigation, and building envelope failure. John and Liddy also provide indoor environmental quality assessments for mold and odor investigations. He's the current president of the Indoor Air Quality Association, a Florida licensed mold assessor, and the ACAC certified indoor environmental consultant. He's also served as an expert witness in over 100 court cases, and he's been a frequent, uh, he's a frequent listener and contributor to IAQ Radio. John, do we have you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you? Great, John. It's good to have you, buddy. So, is this two years now you've been president of IAQA or three? Yeah, it's, uh, it's my second term, second year. Second year, and you're outgoing in June then, is that, or somewhere around there? That's correct, June. And then we've got Bruce, Bruce White coming in. Um, I guess, you know, what, what's, tell listeners a little bit about the last two years and what you've been trying to do to get IAQA to help with keeping this industry, um, you know, on the straight and narrow, I guess. Well, it's been very important for the IAQA and, and for me to bring the industries together. And uh, we have the IAQA Allied Industry Partners. Uh, the partners consist of the Restoration Industry Association, American Industrial Hygiene Association, National Air Duct Cleaners Association, IICRC, Environmental Information Association, National Air Filtration Association, American Bio Recovery Association, and the Lead and Environmental Health uh, Association. And our intent with these industry associations is to begin an MOU agreement 
that identifies the prevailing industry standards of practice in all our areas of practice. The first MOU went out a few weeks ago on uh, mold remediation. And what were the industry, the agreed upon industry standards of practice for mold remediation? And that included mold assessment. And those were the ASTM D7338, the IICRC S520, and the NADCA ACR. So that MOU, identifying and accepting those three uh, industry standards of practice as the prevailing standard of practice for mold remediation is agreed upon by all of these industry organizations and what we should be following instead of attempting to reinvent the wheel and write new standards and you know reference New York City Department of Health or EPA tools for schools. These are the consensus body standards of practice that should be recognized by all practitioners. And the, the best part about it is we all agree to include these three um, standards within our training. So all of our training uh, internationally can be equal. So each one of us will start referencing each other's standards of practice and including them in our training. Interesting. Now, so e you did not include EPA mold in schools and commercial buildings, even though that's, that's a guidance document, not a standard. Um, are we saying we, we should not follow that anymore? No, not at all. We're saying that there are certain consensus uh, standards that should be primary, and then there are many other documents that should be listed as references. Okay. All right. And then um, I, I guess, you know, you had a pretty lengthy list of uh, organizations there that have, have participated. Have you had a meeting with all these groups? Has it been in person, go to meeting? Where did you meet? How did this all come about? Yeah, so our, our list is growing. Our, our meeting is uh, once annually at our IAQA uh, winter meeting. This year we met in Chicago, and uh, there was a representative from each one of these industry associations present during the meeting for the agreement. Um, we now have uh, formal agendas and action items. Um, our, action, our first action item was the MOU for mold remediation. We have several other action items uh, to discuss and review other industry standards of practice. And we're also drafting a uh, position statement on the categorization of water and water loss that will be agreed upon by all of these individuals. And John, we'll be, was this your uh, idea? Um, no, the IAQA started this a few years before my term. I've just been working very hard to grow it. Okay. Is it oh, oh, did you mention ASHRAE in that list of organizations? The ASHRAE was not present during that meeting. That's interesting. And now IAQA is a part of ASHRAE, I guess. Uh, what, what do we call that nowadays? Um, it's a partnership. A partnership. Okay. So IAQA is a partner of, of ASHRAE. Are there any other organizations you're, you're reaching out to to try and pull into this? Um, we're interested in any like-minded organization that will agree on what we uh, are agreeing upon together. So in the beginning, pretty much so, anybody's welcome to join, but ultimately what we want the allied industry partners to have is a, an agreed upon body of knowledge for the different areas of indoor environmental assessments. So right now it's kind of all over the board and everybody's referencing different, um, different standards and different guidance documents and, and different municipality um, written guidelines. So, once we're complete, we hope that we can take all of these MOUs and all of these agreed upon standards to different states that are looking at regulating asbestos, lead, mold, whatever it may be, and eventually to the insurance industry and let them know if you're providing a mold assessment, it should be in accordance with this document. If you're providing mold remediation, it should be in accordance with this document. And let's hold everybody up to the minimum standard of practice outlined in the agreed upon standards. All right, uh, John, let's talk a little bit more about IAQA, your time there. What, what, other, what other accomplishment would you say you'd be most proud of during your two years as uh, president? Well, uh, obviously, the Allied Industry Association, the growth of that and the participation in that. Um, there were times not too long ago when you couldn't get all of us in the same room. You couldn't get us all to agree upon um, much of anything. And now we're working together. We're on uh, mutual committees. 
Uh, the IICRC has recently stated that they're looking at uh, establishing new guidelines and standards. And while they, they may be in direct conflict with the current agreed upon industry standards of practice, their intent, as they explain it to me, is that they want to uh, develop these standards with the allied uh, industry partners and make sure that they incorporate the MOU standards. So that they wouldn't be reinventing the wheel, they would simply be using the S500 and the S520 to refer back to the industry standards of practice, which would include uh, the, the NADCA ACR, which is a very important standard, and uh, IICREC has stated that they're interested in writing a duck standard. So the president of NADCA, Richard Lance and myself, uh, wanted to make sure that we weren't reinventing the wheel, and the IICRC has made it very clear to us that they're not wanting to write an independent standard. They're simply wanting to break away the, the duct cleaning section of the S520 and make it more relevant and more reference to NADCA. So the allied industry is probably the most important aspect of my presidency in bringing the industry together. Um, we're also working with ASHRAE on their position document on indoor air quality, and I'm really happy that we're doing that. We're working with the American Industrial Hygiene, Hygiene Association, again, on a joint uh, body of knowledge for the indoor air quality practitioner. The IEQA uh, stood up for the EPA and uh, the indoor air program by me writing a letter directly to the Senate supporting that program. Um, we have new MOUs uh, during my presidency with uh, two national training organizations, the Environmental Health and Safety Training uh, Corporation and Aramsco to provide good solid training nationally that would incorporate a standard uh, area of, of knowledge. So if you can remember in the not so uh, recent past, it was very difficult to get a course approved by IAQA. And now what we've done is we've said that if you're gonna teach any one of the areas and call it IAQA approved, then you have to cover these certain areas. And those areas are the ones that we're distributing now via MOU. So if you want to learn to be a, a mold assessor, you need to learn these documents and these reference documents and these standards. So now with these national training uh, companies, we know that we can spread our training internationally, covering the same body of knowledge and provide the same level of training all across uh, the world. Um, we've also, uh, we're looking at reestablishing our position statement on certification to gain clarification over uh, classroom training versus uh, actual certification. So there, there's a lot going on. We've got a great staff at ASHRAE. We've got great momentum. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of my, my presidency. John, I, I was at the conference recently, and, and then after the conference, actually even more so recently, I got, you know, there's been some hiccups, obviously. There's, you know, there's always going to be hiccups when you try and combine these organizations. And, and the biggest complaint I hear is about the conference being combined with the AHR Expo, which is mammoth, you know, 2,000 booths there, and, and people feel like maybe they're getting a little lost in the shuffle. Um, what are you doing with respect to trying to help with that? I mean, attendance has not been great at the last couple of conferences. It's been down. Uh, I think, you know, that's that's a little disappointing for people. Um, and, you know, like I say, some of the, the vendors, I think we had eight or ten maybe in the IAQA pavilion this year. And, um, you know, over the years we've had a lot more vendors show up at the old IAQA conference. What are you doing to try and help with that issue? Well, I think we had 30 booth spaces uh, sold out this year at the conference. And we're, we're sold out every year. And every year, our IAQA pavilion at um, the, the conference is growing. So the more we sell out, the more room we get. And we get mixed feedback from the, uh, from the conference. So the, the expo for some is incredible that they have a tremendous amount of increased traffic. And for others that remember it being a much smaller show, they like the idea of it being small, where they can talk and, and see people that they remember. 
um, at the uh, the current expo, the, the shared expo, um, you end up with a substantial amount of increased traffic, which means you see less familiar faces, but you're also getting a tremendous amount of increased traffic. So it kind of goes both ways, but we're sold out. Um, last year, we're almost sold out for this next year, and each year our space is uh, increased. And I will say I was very, very impressed with our attendance this year. We, we were unfortunately hit by some substantial national disasters. Yep. Uh, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Florida, Texas. Um, some of our largest membership bases are in Texas and Florida. And the vast majority of people that I spoke to in my home state of Florida told me that they just couldn't make it. They were just too busy. And I know that the, the hurricane recovery is no longer in the news. And, and people seem to, re to feel that if it's not in the news, it must be over and everybody must be made whole. That's that, that couldn't be further from the truth. We still have displaced people from Puerto Rico and Florida. We still have displaced people from Florida. Displaced people from from Texas, people that whose homes have been completely destroyed and they're not yet home. And let, let's not forget the fact that we still have people recovering from Matthew one year prior. So we were down quite a few members from those areas, the the islands, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, Texas, and Florida. Um, but yet we were very close to our attendance from the year prior. So I think our attendance is growing despite the conditions that led to a lot of our members not attending. Prior to how long have you been uh, combined with ASHRAE now? Is it three years, four years? Has it been? Uh, four years now. Four years. Okay. Prior to that, we had another management company. Um, and, and most people know Glenn Fellman used to join us on the show pretty regularly. And uh, I know it's a little sensitive, but, you know, we've never asked about it. Whatever happened with Glenn Fellman? Um, what happened to the old association management group? And why did we have to jump over to ASHRAE uh, when we did? Well, there were financial concerns with our prior association management company. Um, they managed us and, and several other uh, industry associations. Um, it led to uh, us needing to look elsewhere for an outside management company. Uh, we put together a steering committee, received several proposals to manage IAQA, and we went with ASHRAE who offered to manage us and, and help us grow. Uh, it also gave us access to a lot of ASHRAE uh, members, a lot of ASHRAE collaborative committees, um, and it's worked out very well for us so far. So uh, it was difficult. Uh, Glenn has since uh, been moved on to uh, other areas. Uh, the, the situation was financially difficult for us and other organizations. And uh, Glenn has had to pay the piper for what has taken place. He's still in the process of uh, finalizing that aspect of his life. But we've separated clean and we're moving on. All right. Fair enough. Um IICRC, they recently put out a request for committee members to work on a fire standard. Um, I know RIA, IAQA, I guess under ASHRAE now, so ASHRAE and RIA, um, and it used to be under IESO, which I, I understand is, is gone, but maybe you can clarify that for us, had worked on some fire standards and had some pins uh, that they had put in on fire standards. Um, why does IICRC need to develop a fire standard if that work is already being done by IAQA, RIA, and others? And um, with your new allied association group, have you been able to iron that out and, and get things straight so that, you know, obviously there's a need for a fire standard. Um, I think, um, I don't maybe Cliff would agree or not, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, there, there's not really a one fire standard that everyone follows, and I think that's an area that needs some standardization. But uh, can you tell listeners a little bit more about what's going on there? I mean, it seems like you're working with IICRC, but then I see this request for committee members to work on a fire standard. I know you guys have worked on fire standards. Where are we? Well, I can't speak on behalf of um, IICRC and, and, you know, why they decided to um, not reach out to us. I would say that obviously 
this was in the works prior to our last Allied Alliance meeting and prior to the initiative of signing MOUs on standardizing our, our agreement on what was going to be the industry standard of practice. So having said that, we know that the industry is very small, whether it's indoor air quality, um, fire uh, damage restoration, water restoration. So there's no doubt that there are people from our joint RIA IAQA committee on the fire standard now working with um, IICRC, and that's fine. The intent would be that, again, if they're looking at creating a document, we would hope that that document would reference back to the standard of practice that is almost complete and part of partially out for public review, um, the joint RIA and IAQA standard. So we will uh, uh, file a grievance with ANSI for duplicate standards, but at the same time, we're gonna reach out to IICRC and see how we can combine efforts and maybe just get them involved in ours. Uh, but definitely we don't feel the need for multiple duplicate standards. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I appreciate that. You know, and, and I also want to say I appreciate you being uh, willing to talk about tough issues with us. Uh, you know, we, we really like to help keep the industry apprised of what's going on with these associations and uh, appreciate your uh, candid feedback on these things. Let's to go to the next question I've got here, and that is associations helping consumers. You just see some, it drives me crazy. I had another email yesterday about, um, you know, a scam, essentially, another silver bullet, uh, another company promoting a, a silver bullet that's going to solve everybody's problems, and they're going to spray some foo-foo juice, and everything's going to be fine. Um, how is IAQA and other associations, how are they helping consumers from getting ripped off by unscrupulous in, in particular, I see a lot with mold scammers out there. What are you guys doing about that? Can you do anything? Well, we, we hope to do a lot. And the only way that we're going to do anything is to ensure that there's a consistent message between the allied industry partners and the IAQA that's consistent with the EPA, the CDC, and our local health departments. So the way that we do that is we come together with position statements on uh, chemical usage, on uh, the categorization of water, and we all publish them, our position statements, on our individual websites to start drive traffic to the consistent me message that certain things are acceptable, certain things are within the industry standard of practice, and certain things are just bells, whistles, and magic potion. Okay. And what we'll do in the second half, I'd like to, you know, because one of the things we talked about, John, was the ASTM uh, standard for assessment of, of fungi and buildings. And um, we're going to talk about that during the second half of the show and kind of, you know, keep with, with you, try and emphasize the right way to do this. And, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully it'll keep catching on. But I guess my follow-up to that is Florida and other states started regulating mold and Florida. I, I don't know how long has the Florida regulation been in effect now, at least five years. It was voted in in 2007, enacted in 2010 and forced in 2011. So six or seven, seven years, basically it's been enforced as you say. I mean, I, I, I right. guess that that's a, a, that's a loaded term. All right. And, and sure. forced. Um, what have we learned about trying to regulate something like mold. Um, are these regulations part of the answer or not, in your opinion? Well, it depends on how you go about it. So I can tell you how Florida missed the, the ball. Um, we had a great opportunity in trying to uh, regulate the industry. And quite frankly, I was very much so in favor of it. But uh, as with all legislation, the, the devil's in the details, and the details should have been very specific to referencing the prevailing industry standards of practice that regulate mold assessment and mold remediation. And without that, we simply have anybody that wants to provide a mold assessment collecting little more than a few air samples and passing that off as a mold assessment, or even worse, calling the collection of uh, airborne mold spores an air quality test. Uh, so, so that's where we're lacking. We really haven't improved or raised the bar 
by defining what is a mold inspection. Uh, this same thing with mold remediation, without defining what constitutes uh, a minimum standard of practice for mold remediation, you leave the door open for anybody that has a bell or a whistle or a magic potion to uh, present that as mold remediation because we didn't recognize the industry standard of practice. So that left the state of Florida with trying to establish their own, which led to a, a large infight. So you had the uh, mold assessors and home inspectors that wanted to continue to get paid for um, uh, an air quality or a mold assessment with little more than the collection of air samples, wanting to reduce the standard to just the collection of air samples. You had the professional uh, indoor environmental guys saying hey, you've got to follow the industry standard of practice, just adopt the ASTM. And you've got the remediators saying we don't want us, anybody telling us what to do. Um, we don't need assessment. And the, the waters got muddied very, very quickly to the point that we, we have no standards uh, set by the state of Florida. What we're left with is for the uh, industry professional to be held accountable to the prevailing industry standard of practice. Um, the acceptance of the MOU by the allied industry uh, partners really gives teeth to that. So they can't any longer say, well, uh, mold assessment is the collection of air samples when the industry standard of practice differs. So the state of Florida and many other states miss the boat um, where the state of Florida benefits is they still get to tax us for the renewable license and tax us for receiving a license but there's really no enforcement for anyone that doesn't actually provide a good assessment because there's no definition of that. Um, there is teeth for the state to uh, keep track of poor assessments. Um, that's not really being pursued that much. Um, there are provisions in the, uh, the statute prohibitions and penalties that prevent a mold remediator from giving a, a fee to the assessor for the referral of jobs, but uh, clearly that hasn't stopped. Uh, we've got mold remediators providing fees to mold assessors all over the, the place. It's, it's fairly out of control. John, I've got, all right, first, first I think, do you want to follow up now or after we discuss these state regulations? And um, then I've got a text well, I, I can do it without, uh, it, you can finish state, because it, right. it, it's about that, but it would be a good follow-up to that. All right, let's 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 get the text question here, John. Uh, a listener says, New Hampshire mold service licensing requires ACAC credentialing, uh, CIE, CMC. This makes sense. Um, what is your view of New Hampshire's approach, I guess? And then I got another comment that it makes more sense than New York's reinvention of the square wheel. New York's is a, a, an absolute nightmare from what I understand. But, John, let me have you comment on those two. Well, those are, those are great questions. So let's start with New Hampshire and the outstanding work of uh, a good friend, Guy Sylvester. You can't ask for anything better. Um, the, the question will remain, will Guy's original – intent stand because if you look at Florida we started out with with saying that you had to be a member of an, uh, a national industry organization that had certification based on a proctored exam well today a proctored exam can be given by anybody anywhere at any time and mm -hmm. the industry organizations have been reduced to anybody anybody that wants to start an industry organization and anoint themselves president and start training. The training isn't based on the industry standards of practice, it's based on what they want their people to do. So you've got industry organizations that are basing mold remediation on no removal, enzyme-based, uh, chemical-based, sanitization, and all of these people are approved for licensing. It's no longer just ACAC. So it's been completely diluted in Florida. Any training by anyone for anything regardless of the standards you're in in Florida. If you look at uh, New York, they decided that they were gonna start with their own industry standards of practice where they simply should have said, hey, you need to follow the prevailing industry standards of practice. If we can agree that if you're gonna build a building, 
You need to follow the, uh, the standard code that's been adopted by your municipality. Why don't we just, every state that has legislation for mold, adopt the prevailing industry standard of practice just like we do the code? Then everybody's doing the same thing everywhere. It would work out better for everyone. But that's the loophole. That's what everybody misses. Locking down what the definition of, of an acceptable certification is and training and what that training consists of and what this standard of practice is for assessment and remediation. All right. Cliff, why don't you go ahead and get your last question, and then we'll go to halftime. Thanks. John, you know, from your perspective in Florida as a mold assessor, um, I'd like you to comment on abuses that I've heard about uh, about the assignment of benefits by either remediation contractors and or general contractors. Um. So assignment of benefits is, is like the third rail, right? Um, there are many that don't need it, many that don't use it, and some that swear by it, and some that won't perform a job without it. So clearly, there are times when the assignment of benefits is necessary. If a check is cut to a homeowner and they cash it and move to Vegas, then yeah, the restoration contractor is, is screwed. So the assignment of benefits can come in, you know, very handy in, in many cases. However, in Florida, it's being used as a tool. So what's happening in Florida is the assessors are providing very, very limited assessments. They're not even close to the industry standard of practice. So they collect a few air samples. Um, they use the term stachybotrys, black mold a lot. They convince the homeowner that they're needing a substantial amount of water damage restoration. In many cases that I review and many that I talk to, they've re received incentive from the restoration contractor to establish the need for mold remediation. That's their purpose in life. And the benefit is no matter what their training or certification, because the assessor has an assignment of benefits, there's an endless line in the state of Florida of attorneys that will litigate to get them paid for, quite frankly, their, their half-assed work because they have an assignment of benefits. So we have now people using someone's address and their unfortunate loss as a means to an invoice with leverage from an attorney. So that would be specific AOB abuse. It seems like in the state of Florida, we're no longer working for the client. I was recently accused of being a sellout to the insurance companies, when in reality, every job that Lydia and I work on, we work for the property owner. We work for the best interest of the property owner. I never look at a policy and I never sign an assignment of benefits. May not be in the best interest of a restoration contractor if they're becoming accustomed to an assessor not being specific to the area of loss and cause and origin, so the remediator can remove just as much as he wants, that's not gonna be favorable for my relationship with the restoration contractor. But the, the assessors are getting paid for it no matter what they do. Pull a couple of air samples, 10 minutes on the job, invoice, no payment within 30 days. My attorney will litigate on my behalf because I have an AOB. I'm going to get paid. Hmm. Well, Cliff, does that answer your question there? I don't know that there's much. That's a tough one. You know, what do you do about it, John? What, what can be done? I mean, it sounds well, like... The answer is, and it may be too late in the state of Florida, but the answer is getting information out on understanding and knowing what the industry standard or practice of your field of profession is. If your profession is mold assessment, then you really ought to know the standard of practice. But at this point, Joe, these guys are making so much money doing so little, they're not about to change. I mean, these guys have very limited backgrounds in indoor air quality or mold, but they've been taught how to run a sampling pump and told that they've got legal backing to get paid for it. It's very hard to take that, that money train away from them at this point. Even if you did teach them the standard, do you really think that they would do their due diligence and unambiguously, according to the standard, define the extent of damage? I mean, that's the intent of the licensing law is that the assessor determines the extent of damage. But the loophole is they're getting paid for just pulling air samples and the remediation contractor is able to continue determining the extent of his damage however he wants. So the, the, the complete intent of the Florida licensing law is, is completely circumvented. 
So I don't know how to fix it, but we're going to try and get word out on what is the right thing to do. And hopefully ethics will outweigh money, even though that hasn't worked all the way to Judas, you know, accepting, what did he accept, 30 bars or pieces of silver to turn in Jesus. So, I mean, it's really what's, tough to separate ethics from money. <laughs> what's in the water down there, John? I'm telling you, I don't see this in other places. I, I mean, is it, why is it Florida? I mean, why? What? Well, because no matter what you do, if you can have one semblance of truth to it, then you're going to have an attorney, legal advice to litigate, to get paid. So, you know, and what's in the water, I don't know, but apparently if it falls from the sky, it's category three. <laughs> and if it comes through the ceiling, it's definitely category three and it poses occupant exposure risk. So the new trend is restoration companies are partnering with pest control companies and roofers and they're looking for any ceiling stain because they're telling me any ceiling stain in anyone's house is $5,000 to me and I'm willing to pay you to tell me the address so I can go in there, help them file a claim because it's, it's category three and it's an exposure risk to you and your family. So let me file a claim on your behalf with an AOB. I'll take care of the billing and we'll save you from the dangerous category three and they're ripping out ceiling stains all over the state of Florida. It's absolutely ridiculous. Wow. All right. We've got a break for halftime here. We're going to stop or thank our sponsors. We'll be back for the second half. And what we're going to do in the second half is go into a little more uh, of the industry standard. We'll start with the ASTM standard on mold and uh, assessments. And then uh, we'll kind of talk about what's actually in there and what we see in the, uh, in the field. IAQ Radio would like to thank our association sponsors. The Indoor Air Quality Association, a nonprofit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Visit them at iaqa.org. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them, wolfsense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are. John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at healthyindoors.com. Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. All right, we're back. Second half. John Lapoter. John, that was fun. Uh, let's let's go to the uh, slideshow for the second half here. Start. Uh, give me slide number one here, John. And that's John. You got to have faith at the controls. All right, so let's go to the next one. We're going to start with the discussion here of this standard. I, you know, it's amazing more people aren't aware of this. I mean, I mean it's ASTM D7338.14 is the most recent version, 2014. And this is a standard guide for assessment of fungal growth in buildings. And if, if people are going training without this being a part of their training, especially for assessment of um, of fungal growth, then I'm, I'm not sure they should be doing training. But uh this standard's been around for quite a while. I don't know if this, John, do you know if this is the second or third version? Yeah, I, think of, I think it might be the fourth. Might be the fourth, so it's <laughs> yeah. for quite a while. It's a good standard. Um, uh, ASTM does good work. And let's go to the next slide here, John. So the first thing they do is they talk about the, the guide is specific to fungal growth, uh, one potential problem, in a, which is only one potential problem in a building environment, maybe part of, but not as intended to take the place of, a comprehensive indoor air quality investigation. And we, we will see later they also have a standard for a comprehensive indoor air quality investigation. John, comments on this section? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to note that the ASTM has a standard for indoor air quality. That's the D7297. So when people talk about... Um, providing an air quality sample in someone's home, what they're really doing is over-promising and under-delivering. So we try to call the attention to the fact that there are two distinct standards. One, to overall evaluating residential indoor air quality concerns, 
and one specific to fungal growth. So when you're isolating a mold and you're looking for mold or assessing for mold, call it a mold sample. You don't see us going in and taking an air sample for lead or asbestos or VOCs and calling it air quality. It's simply another example of overselling and underdelivering and trying to get paid for something that it's not. So if you're collecting air samples from mold spores, I've said it before, call it an air sample from mold spores and reference the D7338. All right. Next. So 1.3, they describe minimum steps and procedures for collecting background information uh, on the building, procedures for evaluating the potential for moisture infiltration, uh, procedures for inspection of suspect fungal growth, and procedures beyond the scope of a basic survey that may be useful. So this kind of gives you a little overview. Anything you wanted to add there, John? No, it's just very important to to conduct uh, the the interview. The interview can be conducted on phone prior to to um, showing up on the on the property. Um, you can advance that while you're on the property with a walkthrough. But nothing beats a good solid interview. Yeah, and the, I know the um, indoor air quality standard. They have three interviews. They have the phone one, and then they have one when you arrive at the site, and then they have another one after you've walked through. Um, right. Exactly. All right. So then they, you know, we, we skipped a few sections here, but we want to go over some of the key points here. The, the, the section 6.4, and this is one I know has been a pet peeve of yours for years, and I, and, and I think a lot of people in the industry always list the cause and origin. John, comments on that? Well, this is critical. So what separates a good mold assessor from um, a sampler is the ability to identify these different bullet points of the cause and origin. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's say that you're um, working with uh, an office and the building owner has hired you to determine where the mold is coming from or if there's mold in the building. You have to determine for your property owner if it's construction related, envelope related, wind driven related, humidity related, occupant related, exterior drainage related, or related to the ventilation system. They're looking for those answers. They don't want you to take a test and say, aha, you do have mold there and I'm gonna give it a name, Aspergillus penicillium. Nobody cares about that. My clients wanna know the answer to these questions because if it's occupant related, then we need to go down the road of correcting that issue with the occupants. If it's HVAC related, we need to correct the HVAC. If it's building related, envelope or construction related, we need to make those corrections. But ultimately to prevent it from coming back, you need to be able to answer these questions. Now oftentimes I get told by assessors, they're not qualified to do that. I'm like, well great, go back to tech school and become a plumber. Find a new <laughs> job because this is the minimum standard of practice for your industry. Well that was a follow up, John. Is, is it in the state and, and those of you listening in, I know i got Bob and a few others that, that deal with other state regulations. Is it within the state regulation in Florida that an assessor must determine and list the cause and origin? No, it's not. It's not that definitive. I mean, that's just crazy. If you're going to have a mold assessment standard or uh, regulation, it just – it's just mind boggling that um, they wouldn't have that in the regulation. Now I, I'm going to check the, uh, check the, the guys. All right. So it's kind of in New York. Is that what it says? <laughs> it's kind of in New York. It's not in New Hampshire. I don't know if it's in Texas. Um, I know at one time it was in Virginia and then Virginia repealed theirs, but it's just crazy. If you're going to write a state regulation on mold, this has got to be in there. Somebody has to figure out the cause and origin. Next, so the, next. The answer to the to, from the state of Florida was they wanted to make sure that the the statute would pass, and they didn't want to deny anybody the right to work. They didn't want to uh, define the scope so tightly that people would be uh, put out of work that were previously doing it. But the answer to that question, and I've said this to everybody in every state that's looking to do that, don't make the same mistakes reference the industry standard of practice so your statute doesn't have to. Your statute simply reference the prevailing industry standards of practice. We missed the boat on that. Therefore, people can take an air sample 
turn it over to the client, bill the insurance company what we would charge for a full assessment, and the attorneys will get you paid. Hmm. Interesting. All right, let's go to the next one. Always use a site map. Inspection and documentation, site map, a site floor plan should be prepared showing each inspection classification as determined in 7.5.6. The plan should be sufficiently detailed to allow each area of interest to the assessment to be unambiguously located. John comments on that. Most important thing that anybody should take away from their assessment is that they are unambiguously defining the extent of damage and the cause and origin. So the word of the day for an assessor should be unambiguously. Good point. Go back one if you would, John, because there was a point I wanted to make on this, um, listing the cause and the origin. It doesn't mean these guys have to be, you know, those of us doing mold inspection, mold assessment, have to be experts on everything. You can bring in other people to assist you with determining what the cause and origin was. It just needs to be in your report when you're done. Is that that's, your understanding? That's absolutely, correct. That's, that's absolutely correct. If you're not comfortable with making the determination and you think that a window might be leaking, but you don't want to make that determination, then bring in somebody to help you make that determination. And don't be afraid to use these remediation guys either. Sometimes, you know, they've looked at hundreds, thousands of jobs. They've seen water damage issues over the years, and they can be very helpful in helping you determine the cause and the origin. All right, let's go two more slides here. All right, 7.62. This is your documentation of suspect fungal growth. Wherever, wherever suspect or confirmed fungal growth is identified during the inspection, documentation should include the extent, the severity, and clues to the apparent cause. John, comments? Yeah, this is, this is critical. So um, I've had people tell me that my reports are actually written in a way that makes it easy for the, uh, the insurance company to, to deny coverage. And I'm look, I'm just following the industry standard practice. I don't know what a policy says or doesn't say. I can't, other than my own, I've never looked at one. I just don't care. My job is to determine the extent of damage and the severity. So if that leads the insurance company to try and, you know, nickel and dime you on whether or not it was there since yesterday or 13 days or 14 days, or whether or not they're going to pay you for 13 days worth of damage versus 14 plus, that's not my job. You know, I didn't sign the policy when you agreed to it. You've got to look at that before you sign your policy. But for me, I just determined the extent of the damage and the cause and origin. And my clients have always been really happy for it. You know, we're, Lydia and I are going into our 18th year of providing assessments this way. Never once used an AOB, never once litigated for our money, never once had to put a lien on a property, and never had to negotiate with an insurance company. You know, and the other thing is, I think people look at insurance as the enemy oftentimes. And, and you know, if, if people continue to suck every dime they can out of insurance, whether it was deserved or not, all that's going to do is increase costs for everybody else. Um, so I think we have to be a little cautious about always trying to, you know, be the, you know, make sure that everything is covered. I mean, if it's covered, it's covered. If it's not, it's not. Let's go. Right. I think, Joe, one of the most important things that you hit upon is when we look at these Category 3 water losses and the fact that it's running rampant through the state of Florida, is what we're going to end up having is more clearly defined policy exclusions for this crazy Category 3 water. And it's only going to end up biting the people with legitimate losses because we're making mountains out of molehills and the insurance company is going to catch up. So we're going to end up with, with tighter policies, with bigger exclusions, and, and higher deductibles, so and higher premiums. We're only hurting ourselves, and the people that are hurting us are the people that are using everybody's address as an opportunity to make money. It's ethics versus money. Where, where do you draw that line? It's, it's very difficult here in Florida. Okay, 7.6.3, we're still on documentation of moisture damage. In addition to documenting the location, Further documentation should include the apparent source of the leaks and the apparent timing and duration. For example, whether the moisture issue has been resolved, is active, currently wet, or let's go to the next one, John. Uh, all right. Any, any comment on that last one, John? 
Now, this is where uh, some people would say that it appears the standard was written by the insurance companies. I can assure you that it was not. Um, it's simply a, an attempt to determine the extent of the damage and how long it's been going on for the benefit of the property owner. Understand that this loss could be in a building that my client owns while it's being occupied by a tenant that allowed this to happen. So I need to know this information for my building owner. People forget that because they only look at the insurance side of it. Every time I write one of these, I'm writing it for the building owner. It might be a high rise building, it might be an office building, it might be a manufacturing plant, it might be a house. But the house could be occupied by a renter. And if the renter allowed this problem to go on for an extended period of time, my client needs to know that. Not just that there's mold there, but everything that's what we're talking about today so they can hold the right people accountable. Cliff, you have a follow-up? Yeah, I do, John. In, in terms of this Category 3, and in Florida they're calling everything Category 3, are they, you know, I, I, Category 3 initially started out as having fecal contamination in it from, from a sewer backup, and there was a chart in one of the, uh, I think it was an NS500, that, yeah. that, that showed this duration. And it said that, you know, water over so many days, category one water over so many days would become category three. What are they utilizing to determine that this water is category three? That is one awesome question, Cliff. And the answer is they're definitely taking laboratory samples. And they will definitely tell you the level of mold spores in the air, which will definitively confirm the category of water. It has absolutely no sense. It makes no sense at all. But you'll see entire condo buildings shut down with thousands, mind you, thousands of dollars of air sample, not a, for mold spores, and not a single sample for bacteria or any other category three contamination. Yet the building is shut down with recommendations to remove a substantial amount of drywall based on category three and no cooperation of the category three. The benefit to that is these guys actually write clearance criteria for the category three that again is only air sample. So I can go into these condos or homes that these guys are litigating to destroy and clear them by using swab samples, cultures, ATP, and again air samples and allow the building occupants to reoccupy. And then of course we litigate because the guys have an AOB, which they feel gives them a right to go back in the house. But the shorter answer, they never sample to confirm. They just make the assumption and then everything's gone. And if someone were trying to prove differently, there's nothing left. Our only benefit is if we get there before they remove it. All right, so let's go to, I think one of the most important parts of this whole document. And one of the things we don't see often enough is a written report. Instead of just sending out lab results of a spore trap air sample or a tape lift or whatever, there should be a written report. The report should include the background information, the methodology, including the limitations of the methodology, uh, the suspect fungal growth, estimated square footage, the moisture issues, and I don't know if there's there more on the next slide here, John. Non-fungal factors, if applicable, conclusions about the causation, timing, duration, recommendations for site management, moisture control, and remediation if necessary, and then photographs to illustrate the conditions with captions that clearly note the location and the context. So I think, John, this is one of the things you really wanted to point out that should be in a properly done uh, mold investigation, fungal assessment, whatever terminology you want to use. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm asked by my client to determine whether or not the assessment was provided correctly, then I'll take the, uh, the report from my property owner and I'll read it. And if it's a little more than laboratory samples, I tell them, ask for your money back or don't pay them because they provided you no useful information. They did not follow the industry standard practice. They have no written summary. It's, uh, it's not worth anything. The, the, you can't make any determination of any property based on one or two air samples randomly collected in the property. You have to have a written report, pictures, more Looks background different. information. 
Don't be afraid to go in. Intrusive inspection for fungal growth. Assessing covered surfaces or building envelope assemblies may be necessary where suspect fungal growth or moisture indicators are not visible or moisture pathways potentially impact materials suspect to growth. So this is something that um, is sometimes building owners don't want to hear it, but you've got to do some intrusive inspection from time to time. John, any comments on this one? Yeah, I, I love this part. We've got a presentation called You Gotta Go In. <laughs> and, oh no, it said we're going in. And uh, it basically shows us doing several mold inspections where we think that the wall's wet or we think the window's leaking and I open it up and water test the window or an area of the wall and confirm that it's leaking or a roof um, or the exterior grade. We'll open it up. I'm not afraid to go in. I'll cover it up with plastic. But yeah, I'm going in. You have to. It's part of the standard of practice. Unfortunately, most inspectors will have two or three pages of exclusions and they'll say they're you know only going to be able to assess what was visual. Um, some of them are, are so extensive that I swear if they didn't trip over it or if somebody didn't point to it, they're not listing it and they're not responsible for it. But the standard of practice says you got to go in. Sometimes you got to go in and you got to look and confirm. Yes, sir. All right, I've got a couple of texts I want to get to in a moment, but um, let's finish this up real quick, and then we'll get to those. Don't be afraid to go in again. Uh, sample only to test a specific hypothesis. This is one I love, and I hear uh, it just drives you crazy. People go in, and they just take samples without having a, a hypothesis or a sampling plan or rationale or, or looking at the – the benefits versus the, you know, the, the pros versus the cons of doing this sampling. John, any comments on this section? Uh, I've always said that we, sh we would probably be better off if we outlawed the collection of air samples. Uh, <laughs> they just don't serve any purpose. They'll give you false positives. They'll give you false negatives. Um, we have all heard the stories, and I've had remediation contractors in Florida tell me, you collect a few for the show, for the dog and pony show, and you go home and you pull the real ones from your shed. Wow. All right, I get that. I mean, it's it's fraud. It's a scam. It's always been part of that. But uh, today they're being used as, as the entire part of a mold assessment, and you just can't tell anything from it. So if you form a hypothesis, um, in most of the cases for Lydia and I, we'll take a swab of a wall and we'll say, okay, this mold is on your wall. And we'll take an air sample to show them, see, it didn't, it didn't go everywhere. The other guys are going to take air samples to show you that it's everywhere in the room. And one of the analogies we use with our, our clients or our tenants, when they think that the little spot of mold contaminated the entire home, I tell them, if I take a little bit of flour and release it in your office or your bedroom, how much of that flour am I going to be able to find in your living room? And how hard would I have to look for any of it? And how much of that do you think you'd be able to taste? None. It's just not going to happen. So sampling without a hypothesis is just pointless. But you've got to fight the labs that are selling sampling equipment and sponsoring sampling, the mold and film inspectors that are supporting it. It's tough. Well, I think the key here is it says if sampling is considered – a competent sampling strategy should be developed to take into account site conditions, history, statistical significance for the number of samples taken, sampling and analytical uncertainties, and data interpretation. I understand why people take samples. A lot of times building owners want some kind of sampling. They want someone to follow up and do sampling. Um, so, you know, I, I can see both sides of the, of the, of the question there, but the key is, to follow what it says in here. If it's considered, have a proper sampling strategy and test the hypothesis. Let's go to the next one, John. I think so that, that so that last, the last statement on that part is how 99% of bogus air samples are kicked out of any litigation because they can't answer that last statement. They, they didn't follow that standard, so the samples are unscientific and worthless, so they're unsupported. They're, they're tossed. Good point. All right. So I, I had one I wanted to ask you about. There are numerous so-called certification firms. Uh, mainly they're training firms. It's very confusing to the consumer. There's a major problem with so much misleading information. 
it is key for the states and county departments of health to clearly state certification criteria. IAQA needs to work with states as a prime directive in order to protect the professionalism of the industry. Right now, it's a free-for-all. Does IAQA have a PAC program? So what's IAQA doing? I know I'm on the Government Affairs Committee at IAQA, and I think Cole Stanton has done a great job of making that committee much more uh, active and, and more involved with state, even some local regulators. What about a PAC, uh, John? Does, does IAQA or ASHRAE have something like that? And, and does ASHRAE get involved with, you know, ASHRAE is a pretty big organization. They have a lot of clout. Uh, they do have uh, people that are in charge of their government affairs. They work in D.C. for ASHRAE. Can you tell listeners a little bit about what's going on there? Well, we have a great government uh, relations committee, and our, our government affairs committee is working with the states, and we try very hard to push the difference between certification, um, legitimate certifications, and, and the, the paper mills, if you will. Um, that's why we're looking at the clarification and position statement on certification to, to uh, republish it and republish it with the Allied Alliance uh, partners so we can get on board with what certifications are. Um, that one's going to be a little more difficult than the others, but I don't think you're ever going to stop it. Look, this is America, and if you want to start your own organization, um, what I've had it pointed out to me is one day IAQA started and they had certifications, and if it wasn't a free country, you wouldn't have been able to do that, so why, why would you want to stop, stop me today? Because 20 years from now, I might be the next IAQA. I get that. It's a free country. So how do you how do you legislate that? I don't think you can. I'm not sure how you can. Consumers will never know the difference between one certification and the other. The, there are training organizations and uh, industry organizations that are popping up with very nice names, and they're all there to confuse the consumer. Um, I don't I don't know how to regulate that. It's completely beyond my ability to comprehend. Other than jointly with the the legitimate industry organizations coming out with a position statement that recognizes only a few that we all recognize as being reputable. And I think it's not very difficult to show the progression of certification from entry level, as I took in the early 90s from IICRC, all the way through the advanced, through RIA and ACAC. So it's not hard for us to map the certification program we just want to make sure that we can all agree upon it, fly the flag on all of our websites, and then present that to all of the states and hopefully to the consumers. John, thank you. I appreciate you joining us. Before we go, is there anything you'd like to add, anything we missed that um, you want to make sure you get out to the listeners? Uh, be a part of a reputable industry organization. The best information you're ever going to get is going to come from those industry organizations the newer ones should start working with the ones that have been, the industry organizations that have been around a while. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, do your research regarding mold on the Centers for Disease Control website, not YouTube. <laughs> I appreciate everything that, uh, every opportunity I've ever had, including every opportunity to sit here with uh, you and Cliff. Cliff has been my longtime mentor, and Cliff, who the hell would have ever thought that I would be the president of IAQA. What <laughs> Cliff, final comments. Yeah, I, I think one thing to uh, you know to add on to what John said. You know, this kind of goes back to the IICRC. You know, they have permitted anyone that takes a water restoration class to put all these initials after their name. So yep. I think that that is the most confusing thing to the consumer. Is you know you have you know, Joe Jones, WRT, and the, the customer has no idea what that is. You know, they're familiar with PhD, they're familiar with cert CPA, Certified Public Accountant, and, you know, they, they see somebody show up to their house with a nice-looking truck, and they give them a business card that has these crazy uh, acronyms after their name, and I really believe they are the biggest abuser. I think they know about it. I think they do it on purpose, and I don't think they care. And, uh, you know, in terms of the industry, 
they really have been a double-edged sword. You know, on one side, yes, they've created some industry standards. On the other side, uh, there are negative uh, collateral damage that's caused by that standard. And, you know, the last thing I would like to see happen is for IICRC to write a prescriptive fire restoration standard so that what happens to the water damage industry or what's happened to the water industry doesn't happen to the fire restoration industry. Well, Cliff, you bring up a great point. And, you know, you and I have both volunteered many hours trying to help IICRC. And, uh, you know, I, I think for a while there, they were actually, you had a group of people in there that wanted to fix that whole certification mess that they have over there. And the unfortunate part of it is the instructors, basically the tail wagged the dog and um, it couldn't be done. You know, and, and now I don't know that it will ever get done because things, you know, regimes change. Um, I don't think the current group really thinks that's an issue. They, they feel like, you know, their certifications are perfectly good certifications and uh, it's going to be a real problem. It's going to be very difficult to change. I think it's going to be an issue for John to, and his allied industry group. Maybe you guys can put a little pressure on them. I, you know, we've tried over the years to, to get them to look at what is a true certification versus a certificate. And uh, it's been, it's been a real bear to try and get them to, uh, to do the right thing. You know, um, all they have to do is look at ANSI. Um, you know, ANSI has definition of a certification and they don't follow it. And um, you point it out to them and it's, you know, it's like you're, you're a heretic, you know, I mean, it's, it's horrible. So I don't know what you can do, John, but if there's anything you can do to help, I would certainly think the industry would be uh, better off for it. Joe, if I could say one thing that I think I might have overlooked, which was the final intent of the Allied Industry Association's MOUs, is that this is, this is the information that needs to start top down from the insurance partners that we lack. This information of what is a certification, what are the industry standards of practice, what and how to categorize water, those unified position statements and, and agreed upon standards will be presented to all industry or insurance industry organizations. We will start pushing with them what an assessment is, how to categorize water, what certification is. So instead of denying everybody across the board and questioning everything across the board, they can start looking for specific issues and items within their reports and their estimates so they can call the wheat from the chaff. So we will be working from the top down with the insurance industry. Well, good luck to you, for, you know, to you in that effort. And Bruce White, who I know is uh, incoming, we had on the show not too long ago. He'll be the next IAQA president. Got a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do, a lot of work ahead of them. But uh, the final thing I want to say is thank you for your, uh, volunteer efforts and um, thank you for joining us here. You've been a frequent listener, frequent <laughs> guest, uh, contributor to IAQ Radio, and uh, you don't get paid for any of that, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's why I'm happy to say you'll be in really good hands with Bruce White. He's an outstanding uh, professional. You guys will be in good hands with him, and I turn over the financial burden to Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is Radio Joe Hughes saying thank you to this week's guest, John Lapoter. By the way, next week is episode 500 for IAQ Radio, and um, we've got a couple things planned for next week. Um, we're not going to get crazy, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we will definitely note that we've been around over 10 going on 11 years and 500 episodes, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a few surprises for you here next Friday at noon. Uh, I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Uh, keep keep tweeting and retweeting and uh, going to YouTube and all that stuff. And we look forward to seeing everyone back here next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.